<laughs> well, so I, the reason why I wanted to ask and start by <clears throat> talking about this is we have a really deep fascination, I think most of us, with nature. Maybe for some of us it's a specific animal, some of us it's a, a type of animal, maybe a continent, like you know what's going on in Africa or what's going on in the ocean. But <clears throat> God designed in us, in the Dominion Mandate, a desire to figure out and understand what he's doing. So all those documentaries and the fact that that like, garners a cash response it's kind of a big deal, right? Like there's enough people who want to watch nature documentaries, more or less, not counting NOVA and everything that's on PBS, um, that, that we can have two or three full-time, 24 hours a day channels that are always programming more pictures of animals doing stuff. And we tend to like the ones where they actually explain something that we've learned, like, oh, we've learned that these animals burrow because this, this, and that, or they have this and this or that as a you know, way of perpetuating or protecting the species and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> it's really interesting that the, in this next section, because we got up through um, the end of 38, but not to the end of 38, or through the end of 38, uh, this starts where God begins to essentially quiz Job on his understanding of things that are going on in the animal kingdom. Um, and so this is going to continue on for a couple chapters, really, uh, all the way through the end of God's speech, is essentially going to be describing the astounding creations that God made and challenging him to say, what do you know about this? What control do you have over that? And all of this is essentially rooted to the Dominion Mandate, which we talked about last week. But hopefully we'll all remember that the, the Dominion Mandate was uh, given in Genesis 128. It says, Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish, the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then we find that uh, lest we worry that that uh, dominion mandate was revoked after the fall, that God repeats it, right, to Noah as they're getting off the ark. So Noah, or God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. So we have that continued idea that God designed us to be stewards over the earth, right? That makes sense. Now, before sin entered the world, that would have been a relatively easy task, but it still would have involved uh, Adam and Eve and their progeny learning, discovering, figuring out how these animals were designed to work and how they were designed to work together and to make them all uh, flourish in their own environment, right? That was part of God's plan for mankind to take care of the animal kingdom. Even, again, in the pre-fall state. In the post-fall state, we see that gets very difficult. After the flood, when God instills, instills the fear of man into animals, oh, it gets more difficult yet. But one of the things that God is stating through this speech, through this point, is he's pointing to Job. You might think you're blameless, but you still haven't even done the job that I put you here for. You still haven't mastered this creation. In fact, as we're going to see, many of the creatures here are going extinct. And it seems that God intended that Job or humanity would be involved in keeping his creation alive. So I'm not suggesting we go full bleeding heart, green, you know, liber hippie. But what I am saying is that there is an important part of that mandate for us to understand what God created and do whatever we can in, in, within reason, obviously within the understanding that human life has a, a primacy within the man-animal uh, man distinction. Uh, but we're meant to be positively aligned towards growing to understand that. So that part of you that wants to go out and hike or learn more about nature or learn more about animals is part of what God built into us. We want to know how chipmunks chipmunk, right? <laughs> we want to know how beavers make their houses and, and how these different environments and, and really, and it's important to recognize that, you know, there's a lot of animals, there are a lot of things in the animal kingdom that don't work to their own ultimate success. In other words, if the natural world is allowed to go totally natural, it winds up destroying a ton of life, right? Like the uh, wildfires that we have every year in Colorado. Why do we have them? Well, because the moron hippies won't allow people to clear out the, uh, the dry woodfall and all the other garbage that piles up. We need to manage this world. So then we have, because we're not allowed to manage and control it, we have these huge fires that eliminate all life in that region until it can grow back. So um, it's, it's important that we recognize this because the, the pagan worldview, or we might say the secularist worldview, has this idea that really the earth would be better without humanity. 
But the truth of the matter is, is that the, the earth is meant to benefit from humanity and from our care and making orderly that which is in disorder. So in that vein, God then moves his um, discussions to Job. Now, by Job's time, they would have domesticated quite a few different kinds of animals and, and been pretty productive in that regard. And yet, there, we'll see there's quite a bit more to do. But before we say that, we'll go, before we go on, when it comes to animals, particularly in the book of Job, we have to remember that several of the animals described are going to be extinct. Um, some of them, which we have some kind of record of, uh, others that we, we don't, and we just guess. So a lot of times as we're reading through our translations, we'll get various translations of these animals, and it's because we're not sure precisely what they are. Is it, and uh, can we, and what is usually done, is we look at the description of that animal, and we try to find the closest living, con, you know, comparison point. But what we're going to see is with a lot of these, the animals do not compare to animals that we have on earth, which means that a lot of those animals are probably fresh off the ark and extinct. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so often scholars are simply unsure based on what animal is being discussed, based on lack of linguistic knowledge. So that just happens to have happened. The King James view version often confuses issues by making their best guess. So you'll see unicorn in the King James as well as dragon, which we could argue that both of those might have been perfectly appropriate guesses to their time because the word dinosaur wasn't invented until the 1800s and so the word dragon was what the King James uh, writer or translators had to work with. Furthermore, the earliest dictionaries and encyclopedias in in Europe all included dragons as living animals. So they didn't question that, uh, that as a possibility. So anyway, um, and they would call them dragons. So we've got language issues. And finally, like we said, certain words like dinosaur don't enter the vocabulary until much later in human history. So it would have been used, uh, they would have used other words, dragon, leviathan, behemoth, etc., to try to find like language to fit around it. Does that make some sense? Okay, then we're ready to dive in. Uh, would someone be so kind as to read jo uh, Job 38, 34 through 41? Can you, okay. lift up, uh, can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that an abundance of water may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the innermost being or given understanding to the mind? Who can count the clouds by wisdom or tip the water jars of the heavens? When the dust hardens into a mass and the clods, clods stick together, can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions? When they crouch in their dens and lie in wait for their, or in their lair, who prepares for the raven its nourishment when its young cry to God and wonder about without food? Wonderful. Okay, so uh, sorry I had to read a little bit further back, but 39 through 41 starts talking about the animal kingdom. Now, I want to first point out what, what would that relationship between man and animal would be like just after the fall, before, uh, not, uh, before the flood, basically. Just after the fall. Just before the flood, yeah. So remember, it's not that man is never licensed to eat meat. It could have happened, but it seems not likely. Man was never licensed to eat meat until after the flood, right? And so the fear of it, uh, man wasn't in animals. So it's very possible that there was a more calm relationship between humans and animals. However, it's also possible that a sin kind of got changed everything on a more immediate level, and animals may have immediately began to eat uh, eat each other. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's right. So would be Actually, I, I would argue. Just for yeah, it's, it's why it's so important, and it's a great point. It's why it's so important that Abel actually raised sheep. One, they might have used the wool. That's certainly a, a possibility. And, but um, on top of that, it's, it becomes clear based on the fact that they weren't eating meat that that was just for because God gave sheep or lambs for the sacrificial his sacrificial demand. So it's one of the reasons why we can say with quote, some confidence it was probably a lamb or a sheep that was sacrificed at the, uh, when, at the fall when he made the skins for them. And it is, again, why one of the reasons why Abel's sacrifice was received and accepted because it was 
why they were keeping those animals um, was for that purpose. So, uh, and it, of course, gives us wonderful continuity throughout the Bible, looking to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So all that uh, is, is, is fascinating by itself. But even then, the job might have been quite simpler if the animals were uh, less ferocious. We don't know whether um, God forestalled their desire to eat meat bef until the point after the flood um, or not. But we do know that after the flood, things changed significantly. And um, for all creatures, food became harder to come by, right? We know there was an ice age that immediately followed or very immediately followed um, the, uh, the flood event. And that caused, and when we think of an ice age, right, it's not just the, the whole world turns into an ice cube, but the poles and the, the amount of cold weather kind of crept down towards the equator. So the tracts of livable land became smaller and smaller, which meant that all these animals that had come off the ark were competing for more, you know, a rougher, in a rougher environment to survive. Um, so here he says, can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lion? So first of all, he's obviously pointing out that he, God, is the one who does that. But also, interestingly, points out that um, it seems that he holds Job and humanity accountable to care for the lions. Now, what's our general relationship to lion? If we saw a lion come prowling into this auditorium, what would our first instinct be? I don't have to outrun the lion, I just have to Escape. outrun you. <laughs> <laughs> Escape, yeah. I don't get to outrun the lion, I just got to outrun you. None, one of us would go, I wonder if he's eaten today. <laughs> And, and in a desire to feed him, like, I hope he's not hungry, because that would be sad. No, no, this idea of <clears throat> caring for what is one of our largest predators, rather than just being afraid of it, and like say, we, we would either flee, or if one of us had a firearm, maybe try to kill it or slow it down. I'm not even sure if that would even do much to a lion, but nevertheless, the point is, here he's 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 bringing Job to the place of humil to a place of humility, wherein he's asking, can you can you hunt the prey for the lion? Can you su su supply this your greatest predator with food? Can you afford to care for him? Of course not, right? Job would not be in a position to do that. He was not uh, in a position to like look after and care for lion populations that were just barely keeping alive themselves after a fashion, and then. <clears throat> He points, who provides food for the raven when its young ones cry to God and wander about and lack for, food, for lack of food. So <clears throat> again, this is both dually talking about God's care for and his greater systems that he's put in place that Job and even we don't really understand. But simultaneously, he's also challenging Job to say, I made you stewards of this creation. Are you looking after my lions? Are you looking after my ravens? Of course you're not. You're barely scratching a living by, and you're whining at me because you had a bad day, right? Um, it's a pretty interesting perspective. So with that, we move on to goats giving birth. Just the topic we all so, come to church to. quick question, Brian. Uh -huh. uh -huh. My uh, verse 36, mine is way different than Brian's. Mine says, who gives the ibis wisdom or gets the rooster understanding? This isn't even about animals at all. <laughs> um, yeah, What's so in the mind. Um, who puts wisdom in the mind. Yeah, so that's another great example of the uh, obscurity of the Hebrew language um, because we're, we're, we're learning, we're growing more, but by and large, there's just a great number of Hebrew words, particularly surrounding animals, that we are scratching or reaching for the best. We're going to see when we talk to the thing, it's, or see the thing that is uh, referred to as an ostrich, that it's almost certainly not an ostrich, but it's the feathered, a feathered one almost is what it says. Um, and it's, it's just their best guess, again. So this just says just who puts wisdom in the innermost being, mm -hmm. which is interesting to me. So it doesn't even, like, connect with any sort of animal. No, that's 36, verse 36. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mine says something about an ibis and a rooster. I was just curious. Why? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, without uh, specifically looking into, you know, pulling it up and, and looking it up, um, I can just say with a great amount of confidence that there is a, a disparity. W which two versions? I know you're looking with a NASB. What are you at? Mine's an NIV. You're an NIV, yeah. okay. Um, so, yeah, what I can say with confidence is the Hebrew text comes to us without vowel pointing, and then the Masoretes later added vowel pointing, okay? 
that might. Okay, the Hebrew text was all in consonants because it is a verbal language. And so it's essentially, you couldn't read a Hebrew sentence unless you already knew what it said. It was more of a memory tool than a transmission tool. Because we think of languages like, I wrote you a letter and I moved those ideas across the mail to you or email to you. But the Hebrews thought about language by and large as a way to remember what was going on, right? Or remember, so um, yeah, writing a letter would have been a more difficult affair, I guess, in that. Not impossible, but a more difficult affair. That being the case, you've got all consonants and no vowels, and it wasn't until the 10th century that the, a group of Jews called the Masoretes went through and dotted in all the vowels. Prior to that, we have the, um, uh, the, the Latin translation of the Bible by St. Jerome in the 4th century, I think. Um, and so that was his work trying to get through Hebrew. Then we have the Septuagint, which gives us some information. Uh, and so by using all these means, we come to the meaning of words that are obscure to us. Sometimes there's a disagreement. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, it, it could even be over the same text, the same letters, but we could say, is that talking about this or that? Is this talking about the ibex or is it talking about the, you know, the soul or the mind of man? I didn't know what the ibis was though. I guess oh, it's a bird. Okay. <laughs> I always thought maybe Ibis was another word for a soul or you know, a thing because it's so interesting. <laughs> there you go. That is, well, and again, having spent a lot of time in Hebrew, Hebrew is confusing. It's tough. It's just a tough language to, to get out of, especially as we're not native speakers. John, you had what? a question. I was, I was just going to say, mine, mine said who endowed the heart with wisdom. So mm -hmm. that's another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, again. Oh, I, yeah, so earlier I, you, made the, you made the comment that God was challenging Job for dereliction of duty, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. Which, hmm. I wonder what he would have been thinking at that time. It uh, seemed like he might have had other things on his mind, so I don't know how... <laughs> Yeah, I, I think what he's trying to do is trying to pull Job into the greater understanding that, hey, you haven't even accomplished what I set you here to do, right? Uh -huh. So he's not necessarily like full dereliction of duty, but he's just pointing out, like, you, don't even, you haven't even begun to understand what I've given you to understand. Like, you can figure out where the goats give birth. You can figure out how to take care of the lions. You can figure out how to, we're going to see tame the ox. And all that. You could figure this all out. You could have done this. You should have done this. You haven't even expanded or really come to the point of expounding on all the mysteries I've given right before you. How can you hope to question my wisdom, which is beyond that? He's basically kind of saying, like, you, you haven't finished the Algebra 1 assignment. How can you begin to ask the tri trigonometry 2, you know, type stuff? Does that make sense? It's interesting because when I read this, particularly in, like, 39, it seems to me just... And I don't know why, I can't substantiate this, but it, I read it more as you don't understand how this works, nor can you, I mean, the mountain goats, right? So it, they're probably not even accessible to him. He probably doesn't know how to even get to them to observe what they do. And God is saying, you know, I know, I know exactly what's going on. You don't know what they're doing, right? And mm -hmm. not, not that he was failing in the job, but just that God was trying to explain to him that um, how, how, how much more understanding God had about the creation than man did. So I took it as more of the, what was in chapter 9, which is, it's inscrutable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's definitely a part of that. But what we're going to note is that almost everything that God charges, Job could have known. We could, we know more now than they know then. Like he's going to talk about, well, let's just move on. Yeah, let's keep going. I no, no, we'll, we'll answer track. it. But So uh, who would like to pick up 39, 1 through 4? So do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Do you count the months till they bear? Do you know the time they give birth? They crouch down and bring forth their young. Their labor pains are ended. Their young thrive and grow strong in the wilds. They leave and do not return. 
good. So here, God expects humanity to fulfill that dominion mandate. Even though they don't specifically depend upon goats for life, he expects them to know. And, and by the way, these are knowable things, right? We can figure out the birth cycle and the ovulation cycles of goats and what time of year they uh, tend to have young and all that business, right? So it's interesting that he wants them to know about their diet. He expects them to know about their, his, about their life, uh, life cycle and, and how it goes about. So again, these are things that we could say by and large, we know now, right? And I, I'm sure we could just turn it on and Google it and find out when mountain goats mate. We could figure that out. Why? Because people have done the work for no reason, right? Knowing when the mountain goats mate and knowing what kind of, how many kids they have, like the Never Cry Wolf, or, uh, if you ever saw that movie, like all these kind of weird expeditions that people do to live with grizzly bears or to, to look at undersea creatures, right? Why do we do that? It's the stupidest thing. It doesn't help us eat. It doesn't help us drink. It doesn't produce more money. Why do we do it? Well, because we were meant to, we're designed to understand God's wonderful and beautiful creation. And even more so, we're meant to care for it, right? Which involves understanding how it works. So hopefully what this brings us to, and this is a really important issue, is that true science is part of the Lord's plan for us. It's, it, it's valuable. It's important that we're interested in animals and pets and all the other things that we're interested in, dog breeding and horse breeding and uh, farming and ranching, and all those things are valuable and important for us. And it seems, again, that God, uh, well, absolutely, John, you're right, he is humiliating Job in the sense of showing him how little he knows in relationship to it, but he's also using very specific examples that have to do with the domestication and uh, subordination of the earth, of the dominion mandate. So I think what he's saying is, I've given you, again, this many mysteries to figure out. You haven't even figured out this ministry, many mysteries, and you're going to figure out the mystery of my will? How dare you question me, right, is ultimately what he's coming to at some level. So <clears throat> then we move to the wild donkey. Uh, let's see. Doug, do you want to pick up with the wild donkey? That's five through eight. Who sent out the wild donkey free? And who loosened the bonds of the swift donkey? To whom I give the wilderness for a home? and the salt land for his dwelling place. He scorns the tumult of the city and shouts, and the, sh the shouting of the driver he does not hear. How far are you going to go? To eight, please. He explores the mountains for his pasture. Excellent. And he searches after every green thing? What? No? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's what mine is. Yeah. Cool, good. So we got it. So now we got this wild donkey. And, and so the wild donkey was obviously set free by God. And here the, uh, the donkey is noted for it. We actually got two species of donkeys that we think are being talked about. So sometimes brought across as the wild donkey and the swift donkey, but they were both wild. And again, it seems as if though they are stubborn and though they aren't uh, coming towards society, like maybe dogs that might be more society friendly. These donkeys are not super society friendly. They're super stubborn. But what does God expect? You haven't domesticated them. You're supposed to domesticate these things. These are, these are great beasts of burden, and you haven't done it yet, right? Who, who set them free? I did. You're supposed to deal with these things. And yet uh, he shows himself to be not, um, not doing that, right? Again, showing that Again, humiliating or showing him the limits of his knowledge and their power and their ability. All right, so now we get the uh, wild ox, 9 through 12. Joyce, would you be so kind? Will the wild ox consent to serve you? Will he stay by your manger at night? Can you hold him to the furrow with a harness? Will he till the valleys behind you? Will you rely on him for his great strength? Will you leave your heavy work to him? Can you trust him to bring in your grain and gather it to your threshing floor? Hmm. Excellent. So, this one's wild ox. This is another one of our um, one of our guess words. Another ones that we're guessing at. Uh, um, so the translators of the King James Version translated this interestingly as unicorn. So now we're in a. <laughs> it's, a it's a little awkward, right? Come on. So this is uh, one of the 
What are the charges that's leveled on the Bible, right? Oh, they talk about unicorns in there. You don't believe in unicorns. Okay, well, first of all, let's just all confess that unicorns could exist. We've just never seen one, right? That's a possibility. I'm not saying it's likely, but it's a possibility. (laughs) What's that? Like Bigfoot, exactly. However, far more likely, right, Um, and and some people have even put forth the rhinoceros, the single-horned rhinoceros, and say, well, it's got one horn, and it's... Um, a large, difficult-to-manage beast. Okay, that holds a little bit of water. But even more to the uh, likelihood is that the uh, King James translators were, again, doing their best. with. you, you got to remember, these are people that bathed not more than once a month, that never went to the bathroom indoors. These were people who never saw electricity ever in their lives. They might have traveled a total, some total of 100 miles in their entire lives, they had limitations, right? So we have to recognize that we, with those limitations come some guesses that probably are better corrected. So then uh, modern translators look at this and go, eh, it sounds like a wild ox. That, that's, a, that's a good guess on this. Um, I think it's as likely that it's another of the extinct beasts uh, that we don't know. And it, who knows? It, again, there's no, the unicorn thing's kind of off the cuff. But it could have been some other large uh, and powerful animal. What do we see in the fossil record? Lots of large and powerful animals, lots of big beasts and creatures. So it could be that it's talking about one of those. Um, but either way, what do we see? Hit, uh, that this animal li- likewise was meant to be domesticated. God intended man to domesticate even these large and much more powerful than him animals. That's where an ox makes a decent guess, but again, uh, it seems that the point is that his, the strength of this beast is far greater than human strength, and yet they were meant to be put to good and productive use, right? And again, have, has Job accomplished that in his lifetime? Not yet. Not yet. They, they mastered some, but they hadn't uh, gotten to the point of caring for all creatures um, in that way. All right, 13 through 18. Um, the, wings, the wings of the ostrich flap joyfully. But they cannot compare with the pinions and feathers of the stork. She lays her le- eggs on the ground and lets them warm in the sand. I'm mindful that a foot may crush them, that some wild animal may trample them. She treats her young harshly, as if they were not hers. She cares not that her labor was in vain, for God did not endow her with, with the wisdom or give her a share of good sense. Yet when she mm-hmm. spreads her feathers to run, she laughs at horse and rider. Good. So, again, um, ostrich is the best guess of translators based upon currently living creatures. Now, um, it might be, uh, but the trouble is that the wings described are compared to a stork's, more or less, so it, it, that's another flying bird, uh, and it seems as if seems as if the flightless bird are not necessarily a, um, a perfect comparison. Might be. But it, again, it's very likely that this is another extinct animal, an animal that we don't, uh, we don't see walking around today. Um, the care for his eggs shows a young, or sorry, and her young show carelessness, right? So here she is not taking care and uh, not taking care of her animals. And it's possibly and probably because she was designed, like all creatures, to live in an a a friendly world, a world in which nothing would come after and eat your eggs, right? So this could also be what led to this animal's extinction was the fact that like here Noah's, or or Noah, uh, Job is being challenged like, hey, you got this animal and it's so dumb that it puts its young at risk and it doesn't even care for its young. Why don't you do that? You need to do that. Keep this thing from going extinct. So it's, it's kind of amazing that we see within the context of this at this point, three, and we'll see two more upcoming animals, that it appears when extinct, right? 
What happens when sin enters the world? Death and decay, all the systems start breaking down. Things become food for other things, predator and prey relationships. And all of a sudden, the beauty of God's amazing initial creation starts to dwindle down. Things don't get more beautiful. They get uglier. Things don't get more uh, powerful and complex. They get less complex and simpler, right, as entropy sets in. And so as part of even after the fall, right, the sin that we brought into the world, uh, we are called to care for and take care of this. And so it's kind of fascinating that God highlights a handful of creatures that at least as near as we can tell probably went extinct. And while man is not entirely culpable directly, he really is because we're the ones that brought sin into this world. We're the ones who failed. We're the ones who failed to take care of that, of the creation as it continued to roll downhill, right? So in a way, God is highlighting the results of sin and decay in the world and saying, look, you're not even cleaning up your own messes here. How dare you question me, right? Because we notice that God is never going to answer his question, but he's only going to bring about this larger picture that both shows Job, look, you don't possess the, the right or the wisdom or the intelligence to stand before me and question my choices. But also, he's pointing out in the meantime, you're not even completing what I've got for you so far. Horses! Uh, Joy, are you on? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, 19 to 25. Uh huh. Do you give the horse its strength or clothe its neck with a flowing mane? Do you make it leap like a locust, striking terror with its proud snorting? It paws fiercely, rejoicing in its strength, and charges into the fray. It laughs at fear, afraid of nothing. It does not shy away from the sword. The quiver rattles against its side, along with a flashing spear and lance. In frenzied excitement, it eats up the ground. It cannot stand still when the trumpet sounds. At the blast of the trumpet, it snorts, aha! It catches the scent of battle from afar. The shout of commanders and the battle cry. Good. So the horse is obviously, again, well known to us yet today, right? What's that? Oh, the, the horse. It says it laughs at fear, is not dismayed. A horse is called Skitty <laughs> <laughs> came down the pike. It's true. Yeah, it gets really snakes are. and little. Yeah, absolutely. They are, they are skittish indeed, right? Oh, my gosh, yeah. Oh, my. You know, <laughs> like a, you, you, they have fires in, in stables, for instance, and the horses just panic. Oh, sure. You know. Yep, well, so they're. I mean, back in those days, they used them for war. I mean, they were trained for war. You know, so they probably weren't as skittish when it was going hand in hand, sword to sword. And they were trained for that. But they did have dominion over horses at this point. Well, they were starting to. Yeah, in fact, it's kind of one of the interesting dis points of disagreement between secular history and biblical history is that in the biblical account, we see domestication of animals happening very early, and then the secular accounts, they claim that it happened much later. But the, and this is important. They make that claim based on an absence of evidence. So, in other words, in later carvings and, and writings, they see clear, you know, carvings of a domesticated camel. So then they say, well, that must have been the first camel that was ever domesticated. They got it on film. And that what they're missing is, is that, of course, there were other domestications going on that failed to be recorded. And, again, the thing that I always find most uncanny is that, we have a really good historical document that suggests that at least in certain cases, many animals were domesticated. So it's fascinating to see, you know, how obviously there would be later trends where horses were used more, uh, more forcefully and in a better situation. Um, but by and large, I think, especially if you was further from horses, well, horses are certainly skittish. If you've ever seen a, um, is it a pack of horses? No. Yeah, a herd of horses? Herd. We could have a herd of horses. If you got a herd of horses thundering at you, what what are your chances, do you think? <laughs> Not super great, right? Like not if you're in the way. Yeah, right. If you're in front of them, you're you're probably you're probably not gonna be behind them afterwards. You'd just be carried along as uh, impaled upon a horse foot. But a hoof, as it were. But anyway yeah, I had the same response Brian did, which is and I guess this is all just from the movies, but 
if you you know the image they paint is yeah you could you could get a hundred of them charging a pretty dangerous situation and they'd ride right into it mm -hmm. so I, i'm not saying it's humane <laughs> right but apparently if you go and shoot a gun next to a horse that's never been around guns he's gonna freak out but people train their horses to not be skittish around guns and, mm -hmm. and they used them as, as up till world war one they were using horses for battle oh sure with guns and cannons and bombs and everything else so sure i i can see the point here yeah yeah well and and yeah, again, Doug, your point's well-founded, right? We know that individual horses are super skittish and weird and freaky. Um, <laughs> well, it's just so much animal. And to be so scared by, a, like, a stick shaped like a snake. I had this friend that had a horse, and this horse would not let, let her get its feet wet. <laughs> <laughs> it just hated getting its feet wet. <laughs> just so pristine. I'm not going <laughs> to... That's funny. <laughs> she made it go stand in the creek until it quit. <laughs> <laughs> like a two-year-old. Didn't put boots on? <laughs> horse you boots. Horse boots. <laughs> That's like horseshoes. But, <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, again, horses, strong, tall, fast, fierce in battle. Um, and again, they might have to be trained for that, but they certainly were useful for that. And in fact, as you pointed out, horses were the primary war technology for how many, what percentage, I mean, a huge percentage of Earth's history, a horse was the biggest tactical advantage you can have, right? What else is going to pull your uh, chariot in war? It had to be a horse, right? You're not going to get an, a, a donkey to do that. An ox. An ox, ox <laughs> slowly moving through battle. Hold on, I'll be there in a minute. Ah, got him. No, of course not. It's ridiculous. So, Horses were a great, powerful uh, technology, again, uh, that, that um, he's pointing out uh, in this regard. So he's saying, did you give the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? Can you frighten him like a locust? So all these things, again, pointing out that whether we have or haven't or had or hadn't domesticated or whatever degree, that we don't have power to match all that God created, right? So now we got the hawk. Who are we at? Brian, do you want to read the hawk 26 to 30? Is it by your understanding that the hawk soars, stretching his wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? On the cliff he, he dwells and lodges, upon the rocky crag, an inaccessible place. From there he spies out food. His eyes seize it from afar. His young ones also suck up blood, and where the slain are, there he is. Excellent. So here we got all these uh, ra birds of prey, raptors, hawks, vultures kind of in view. Um, and we notice the engineering of these birds, which allows them to fly. When you think about it, God created these creatures, these animals that can take to the skies and fly almost you know, unspeakable uh, distances. And how long did it take us to figure out how to fly? Goodness, it was the last less than 200 years, wasn't it? So. I still can't fly. <laughs> I don't care how much the plane flies. I can't do it. <laughs> That's right. So, I mean, the reality of the miracle of engineering that goes into, that went into making birds with hollow bones and enabling them to adapt with their environment and see from far off in order to dive bomb and pick up these creatures, as well as the fact that they're scavengers. They have a place in God's larger ecosystem with system for kind of disposing of uh, prey and carry on and all those extra things. Um, so and they're dwelling places in the, uh, in the cliffs and the edges where man couldn't go and be. So all these, uh, yeah. All these features of the hawk, again, to bring Job humility and also to point out, man, there's just so much you don't even understand about this world. How can you begin to question what God is doing in the spiritual world? There's so much here that you don't understand. Have a sense of humility, if you please. It's kind of the part. So now uh, God takes a little break and asks or it says the Lord answers Job, but the Lord answers Job by asking him this, uh, setting this, this challenge before him. Would someone be so kind as to read 1 through 2, April? Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. Good. 
So God's laid out the mysteries which Job did not understand. Man was meant to understand God's creation as a steward of the earth, and God challenges Job as his willingness to question God, right? And again, I want to point this out. We've spent a lot of chapters and a lot of time sympathizing with the loss of Job and understanding why he would want to ask those questions. I hope that we were effective enough in this study that we sympathize with Job in, the, in those why God, why moments. And hopefully, if we have done that effectively, then we will also effectively understand what it's like to sit in Job's point, point, space here when God is, challenges Job and is his willingness to ask, uh, and his willingness to question God. Job is invited to make his answer. Um, and so then we move into Job's response. Then we can kind of discuss that as a whole unit. Who's got a Bible? Kings? Would you read three through five? Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. And so Job is obviously totally humbled at this point, or very much totally humbled at this point, at which point God will take an extra uh, amount of two creatures to m drive the point home. But behold, right? He draws attention. Look at this. Listen, Lord... What I'm about to say is serious. <laughs> I am vile. Now, other translates, other words will translate this. Uh, other translations will translate this word as of small account, unworthy, unworthy. or insignificant. Right? What's he saying? God, I'm very small. He thought in his woundedness, and his woundedness and his his loss made everything seem very big. Like he should be a big deal to God. And as we see from the eternal perspective given at the beginning of the book, he is a big deal. What's happening is a big deal from God's perspective. But uh, ultimately we'd say that jo jo Job feels puny in light of God's self-revelation. Okay, puny in light of God's self-revelation. And now Job, he doesn't want to talk anymore. So... <clears throat> Never mind. Never mind. I was uh, kidding. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> right? Something, something really extreme happened here. But here is the question before we move forward into, uh, into the next uh, section about Job's ability. What's the learning lesson for us here? How does Job's having been silenced by this, what's the application for us today? Mouth shut. Keep her mouth shut. That's a good starting point. What is it? I can't remember who it says. I never had to repent of a word I didn't say. What? What else, though, in her attitude about life? Just be, just be patient and trust, and it's hard, but it's hard. But I think that's that's what I think. Humble, mm -hmm. be humble. Yeah, be humble before the Lord. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, to, to, to Nobu's point, being patient is being able to entrust ourselves to the Lord's ultimate wisdom, goodness, and care. So we might draw a picture here. Job, who really did awesome. I mean, he got solid A, A minus on this assignment. But what would be the A plus? What would the A plus look like in Job's suffering? Unquestionable faith. Yeah, unquestioning. If he were to say, "Lord, I don't know what's going on, but I trust that you do." Obviously, asking the question was acceptable. It's enshrined in Scripture for a reason, and so it's not to say that we should, uh, you know, like punish ourselves for questioning or wondering. But ultimately. What we can learn from the life of Job is, is that God is ultimately totally trustworthy. Even if we don't understand it, even if we go to our grave without an understanding, we will live a more productive and fruitful life if we choose faith over fear. If we choose the trust in who he is and his character and even his plan over our own, uh, would we say, self-absorption, self-concern. Far easier said than done. I promise you, I'm going to drive home tonight and someone's going to cut me off in traffic and I'm going to lose all my perspective. <laughs> Quickly, right? That's not exactly suffering, Rudy. 
not losing perspective. You really need to lose. To, to those people need to be punished, right? No, of course not. Um, well, it's, and further, it, it also proved, it also says that uh, even though, even if we did that, we, we, could, we could not manage it. Mm -hmm. Even if we knew all these things that he's pointing out here, mm. that it's unmanageable for Job or anybody else mm -hmm. to manage. So, you know, we re rely on, on the Lord. Yeah. God, yeah. Lord God. Mm -hmm. For substance. Yeah, absolutely. We have to recognize uh, one of my favorite quotes from The Hobbit is at the very end of The Hobbit, after the whole big thing, he says, um, some, the Gandalf says to him, after, you know, after all, you really are just a, a, a small hobbit in a big world, aren't you? Or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And that recognition that no matter how wise, no matter how bright, no matter how smart we think we are, how are we really doing at this? Well, we still don't understand much of the system, right? I mean, we all like to get all fired up about, up about our politics, but let's just pretend that your politician or my politician won every time. You know, we'd still be in a mess, right? It would make hardly a lick of difference. The system's bigger than that. The, the, the world system's bigger than that. The issues are more complicated than that. And the great thing is that while we should be aware and alert and involved as we can be and being positively uh, involved in our world, our environment, our government, our city government, whatever it is, that we have to recognize our ultimate smallness in, this, in the light of God's great wisdom, power, and ultimate plan which will lead to his glory. Right? And here's the, the real kicker, at least to me, is we really need to know that before the suffering comes in. I mean, we, we're always kind of going through a certain amount of suffering, and some of us greater suffering, suffering, and some of less of suffering at different times, but ultimately we, it helps to have this perspective before. And that's why this is in the Word of God. So that we can have it, it's not like it comes... Uh, like Job's friends who come up and try to solve all his problems. We can choose this perspective before the big suffering comes. We can choose to say, Lord, I don't understand and I don't know, but I do trust you. I do choose to trust that what you're doing is ultimately right, that you're working all things together for good for those who love in your name. So, moving on from there, God questions Job's ability. Uh, would someone... Read 6 through 14. Where are we at? We're at me. Okay. Uh, was it 40? 6 through 14. It says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now prepare, for, prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Who uh, Would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God? Or can you thunder with a voice like his? Then adorn yourself with majesty and splendor, and array yourself with glory and beauty. Disperse the rage of your wrath. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low. Tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together. Bind their faces in hidden darkness. Then I also will confess to you that your own right hand can save you. So now Joe, God's being really direct, right? Gird up your loins. We talked about that. It's like strap, tighten down any loose clothing. Be ready for action, specifically here in the mental, spiritual sense. Prepare yourself. You got what you wished for. Don't you want it, Job? Right? And then uh, he asked Job, is Job, are you going to condemn God just to preserve your own righteousness in your own eyes? It's kind of like uh, the young child who has been told no by their parents. They say, I hate you. I wish you weren't my parents. I wish I didn't have parents, whatever it is. We all saw Home Alone, right? The kid who wished that his family would disappear, and he slept through them leaving, and, and then he had to deal with it, and it was awful, right? It was comedic because it's a funny movie. But you think about what a real kid situation would be like. It would be absolutely devastated, right? The idea of, uh, and this is kind of what God's saying, you really want to prove yourself right and me wrong? Think about the consequences of living in a world where God was wrong or God could be wrong. It's far more horrifying than losing everything at his hands. The fact that God is always right is really the bedrock of our security and our sanity. 
in every sense of the word. So God, God is saying to Job, are you sure you want to ask this question? Are you sure you want to be that two-year-old who's stamping his fists and would rather get what he wants than wait and understand the wisdom of, of God in this case? So God then compares his arm, right, might, his voice, God's voice, his authority. He says, you don't have my might, you don't have my authority, you don't have my majesty, splendor, glory, beauty, all these characteristics of God. And then he says, interestingly, can you judge wickedness and bring low the proud? Right? So obviously part of the agency that was used to uh, take everything from Job was human wickedness. Right, Raiders came and stole what he had, and he could do nothing about it. And Job says, I ultimately will judge everyone justly, and you can't even stop crime in your little community. Think about it, Job. And then he says this the beautiful closing line to this little port segment, that your own right hand can save you. In other words, he's saying, you can't save yourself. Right? You need a savior. You need me, Job. God is saying, you need me to save you. All right, very quickly to, to, to finish out chapter 40, uh, who would read? Oh, John, would you read 15 through 24? Look at the behemoth, which I made along with you, and which feeds on grass like an ox. What strength he has in his loins, what power in the muscles of his belly. His tail swings like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are close-knit. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs like rods of iron. He ranks first among the works of God, yet his maker can approach him with his sword. The hills bring him their produce, and all the wild animals play nearby. Under the lotus plant he lies, hidden among the reeds in the marsh. The lotuses conceal him in their shadow, poplars by the stream surround him. When the river rages, he is not alarmed. He is secure, though, though the Jordan should surge against his mouth. Can anyone capture him by the eyes or trap him and pierce his nose? Awesome. So here's this uh, behemoth. I, I put forth in your notes that it's a brontosaurus, some kind of very large dinosaur. People have thought, or rather modern scholars, again, who've accepted the evolutionary worldview would say, oh, come on, there's no way that he saw something like that. They must have been uh, describing an elephant. But the trouble is an elephant doesn't have a tree like a cedar, right? Neither does a hippopotamus. They will have little dinky, wimpy little tails, whip-like tails, right? Tails, yeah. Right? But here is this creature that is has all of its power in its belly. Now, we have uh, know based on at least what I've read about dinosaurs that sort these, these big um, theropods, I think they're called, or sauropods. Sauropods. Anyway, the four point, the four leggers, the four leggers, right, being the, by far the largest, could actually lift themselves up on their back legs and kind of stand up on their back legs, showing an incredible amount of what we'd call like abdominal strength. Um, so here they are with all their power kind of in their belly and their loins, their tail like a cedar. Again, we know that it swings, uh, that the sauropods didn't drag their tails, but rather they swung kind of to and fro above because they were. Um, supported on their four, four legs with their, uh, yeah, four down-looking legs, whatever, down-pointing legs. Uh, their bones like strong metal. Dinosaurs uh, on Noah's Ark were almost a sure thing, right? So we see that, um, as we talked about with Dr. Clary, right, we saw that dinosaurs almost certainly went on the Ark. They didn't have to be full grown-ups. They could have been small a adolescents. And as they came out of the Ark, what did they do? Well, they started to die pretty quick because they were built in a world that was and built for a world that was far more abundant and far more conducive to life and continuation. And now this new world, especially with the Ice Age, scrunches them all in. There's not nearly as much of a swampy environment uh, available to them. And so by and large, they start to die off um, pretty quickly. And this is why we have fossils and uh, because <laughs> What we see is that anything that would have died after the flood would have been ultimately eaten, rotted away, and, and so on and so forth. What do we see in this, the fossil record? Hundreds and hundreds of, what, dinosaurs that were, had to be very deep and quick, right, so that the fossils could be formed, so that they could be made. In other words, we need a worldwide flood to have the amount of both oil as well as the amount of uh, dinosaur evidence or fossils that we see now, but also we can, it explains dragon stories because of those few dinosaurs that went on the ark, they would have had some children and gone forward and had 
though very a limited impact, an impact throughout the ancient world, which is why we see dinosaurs, as we know, on uh, in various representations like the Chinese zodiac and um, in the yeah, various carvings and temple carvings and the like. We see constant attestation to dragons, dinosaurs, dragon stories, knights killing dragons, and 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 the like. Um, and so this this behemoth was most likely. Uh, uh, and, and you have to put yourself in Job's shoes. Can you imagine? It kind of rewrites our understanding of history. But you, Job is very close to the flood. So it's very possible that Job didn't just see one dinosaur walking through, but many, many dinosaurs in his life. Can you imagine watching a brontosaurus stomp by? Like, what a humiliating experience that would be. And God saying, yeah, I made that guy. I, I made him and I control him. Interestingly, he doesn't uh, talk as much about trying to uh, domesticate him because <laughs> <laughs> it seems less likely. Um, well, our last chapter is about Leviathan. Our second to last chapter is about Leviathan. And I think you guys get the, the gist of this enough that we can just read through the uh, chapter and make very few comments and move on because it's really just driving home that final and last point. So what I'd love to do is have each of us read five verses of verse 41 until we're finished starting with... Doug, did you, were you last? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Five verses of 41, right? Yes, please. <clears throat> Can you go out about Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? <clears throat> will he make many uh, supplications to you? Or will he speak to your soft words? Will he make a covenant with you? Will you take him for a servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bar bird? Or will you bind him for your maiden maids? Will traders barter for him? Will they divide him up among the merchants? Can you fill his hide with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? If you lay a hand on him, you will remember the struggle and never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Any hope of subduing him is false. The mere sight of him is overpowering. No one is fierce enough to rouse him. Who then is able to stand against me? Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under, under heaven belongs to me. I will not fail to speak of his name his strength and his grateful form, great graceful form. Who can strip off his outer coat? Who will approach him with a bridle? Who dares open the doors of his mouth, ringing, ringing about with his fearsome teeth? His back has rows of shoes tightly sealed together. Each is so close to the next that no air can pass between. They are joined fast to one another. They cling together and cannot be parted. Its snorting <coughs> throws out flashes of light. Its eyes are like the rays of dawn. Flames stream from its mouth. Sparks mm. of fire shoot out. Smoke pours from its nostrils as from a boiling pot over burning reeds. His breath kindles coals, and a flame goes forth from his mouth. In his neck lodges strength, and dismay leaps before him. The folds of his flesh are joined together firm on him and immovable. His heart is as hard as a stone, even as hard as a lower millstone. When he raises himself up, the mighty fear, because of the crashing, they are bewildered. The sword that reaches him cannot avail, nor the spear, the dart, or the javelin. The, he regards iron as strong, bronze as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned into stubble for him. Clubs are regarded as stubble. He laughs at the rattling of the javelin. His underparts are like sharp pot sheets. They, he spreads out like a threshing spreads on the net. He makes the deep boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. He leaves a shining wake behind him. One would think the deep had white hair. On earth there is nothing like him, which is made without fear. He beholds every high thing. He is king over all the children of pride. Awesome. So uh, just to make some brief closing comments, I think we might find it almost humorous to think that most modern 
and maybe we could argue secularized commentators will then follow this description and say, crocodile. <laughs> yeah, really reaching hard on that one. I mean, a crocodile, as we've seen, is a very cool animal and even an impressive animal. But obviously what God is talking about here is something quite different, far greater than just a, even a very large like saltwater croc. Spinosaurus. Uh, Spinosaurus, yeah. We're talking about a real, uh, we know it's a sea creature of some kind. We know it has a long tongue, which differs from a crocodile. Um, it's obviously saying you're not going to tame this. You're not going to charm this. You can't even kill this. This thing is absolutely out of your control. You're not going to overcome this beast, but God has and he can, right? So he points out everything under heaven is mine. So God has clearly put things here that the behemoth and the, and it's interesting, he separates it from all the domesticatable animals into these two just monstrous creatures of, of truly epic proportions that he's going, you don't even have a shot against this thing and you want to question my power? I created them. I, I, I have all power and authority over them. This is like a literal fire, the fire breathing monster, too, right? I mean, it's. I, mean, I, I guess you got to read that part literally, too. I would. And so this is again the other thing that people will <laughs> scoff at. They'll say, "Oh, come on, fire breathing dragons." Well, one, mo many of the stories involving dragons that we have passed down do involve them breathing fire. Now, it, it seems a little difficult for us because we don't have any fire-breathing animals. We have the bombardier beetle that shoots a sort of explosive, fiery, uh, acidic thing in very small portions out of its hindquarters. Um, but the fascinating thing is the idea that, and, and it's interesting because if you look at dinosaur skulls, there's a lot of space in there for all sorts of things that glands, if you like, that we don't know about. So the idea that it had some sort of ability to make fire with its mouth is only shocking because we don't see it around commonly now. But the reality is, is that there's no reason to doubt that there might have been some kind of ability for this fire-breathing sea dragon to exist. Right, and someone say, "Well, we don't see it now." Yeah, of course. There's lots of just extinct animals that we know don't that aren't currently living, um, and it, we could see a lot of reasons why it would be extinct. Right, something like that would have a terrific appetite. And again, in the post-flood world, it was much more difficult. But the point that he brings this up is that no weapon formed by men could defeat this creature. And interestingly, he relates this uh, this. Sea dra this fire-breathing sea dragon, uh, very fascinatingly, to Satan, it would seem, on this last thing. He beholds every high thing. He is the king over all the children of pride. So interestingly, here this sea creature is somehow related to uh, Satan. And what was his sin? Pride. Pride. Of course, it was pride. So he's, um, he's the king of all the children of pride. He's, there's this satanic connection even to this creature, which is kind of fascinating because we talk about the serpent which Satan, uh, which Satan inhabited was then punished, right, by losing arms and legs, thereby snakes being squirming creatures. But it seems that other creatures of this serpent kind maintained their arms and legs in terrifying stature. Um, so here's our conclusion. Before God, we are small, and our wisdom and power are hopelessly limited. We struggle even to uh, master and understand what God has created. We know more today, and yet that knowledge is make, only makes us arrogant. Understanding is not creating, right? Isn't that the modern fault? We've figured so much of the things out that God, so many of the things out that God would have us figure out, and we think that because we figured out, we somehow made them. We didn't make them, we just figured them out. God was the one who put them together. That, we couldn't do that part. And so it's kind of fascinating that the atheistic scientific community acts like because we've discovered a few things that somehow we're a master over creation. Yeah. But the same message is needed. We're still humbled before creation, right? Um, we've got to approach God with an attitude of utter humility uh, before him. It is not just what works out best for him and his glory. It's what works out best for us. When the difficult situations of life come along, they may well be entirely out of our control. The only way we can orient ourselves in those storms and those difficulties is by continuing to plummet down and trust in God. If we start to uh, allow the, the 
storms and the trials to shake our faith in God, it only makes the trial worse. Does that make sense? So it's both a self-serving and a God-honoring reality because this is the truth of the matter. Everything that is best according to God's will is also best for us. And um, I think that's what God is ultimately trying to elicit in Job uh, in this case is bring him down to that point of humility to say, I know it all felt out of control. I know it didn't make sense. I know you're scared, but the right thing to do was always to trust in God, to trust in him and his character. Any closing questions or comments? Anything at all? Applications? We could we've solved it with global warming. <laughs> That's right. If we just solve global warming, everything, everything will be great. Everything will be fantastic. <laughs> so when the animals got off the ark, they, pro they probably had a lot smaller area, but there were a, a lot less of them, like two. Yeah. So it would have taken a long time before they would have even, you know, in this case, I think it would have taken a while before they ran out of food. Because mm -hmm. all they had to do is, you know, go a couple of miles and there's nobody else around, right? right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But yeah, that's quite a critter. And the other one was... <laughs> It's interesting, I, I, I didn't realize this was in here on the previous one. He ranks first among the works of God. Mm, mm -hmm. It's like he's basically saying this is the greatest thing I made, right, mm -hmm. on the earth. And you notice that he says just before that, he was created along with you. He points out the proximity. Which I made along with you. Yeah, so when were all land creatures made? Land creatures, anybody remember? Day six. six. Yeah, all of day six. All these land creatures. So the, the brontosaurus and everything else is... It's right out of fingers. Uh, <laughs> that's good. So yeah, uh, day six is when all these creatures were made. So here Job affirms the creation week and that we were all... All these creatures, us and them, were all created on day six in close proximity. Well, and if it's relating it to Satan... He said that that was his most beautiful angel. Mm -hmm. So he's created first. Mm -hmm. This is his most, his greatest creature. Yeah. It's Although interestingly, that this one doesn't have his image. Oh no, clearly not. But well, I think that the relationship is is more symbolic in this case. So obviously, Satan, uh, Satan comes first, uh, possessing the serpent, and he. As we've seen through this, Rahab and through sea serpent imagery he's been alluded to and dragon imagery. Uh, and then we're going to see that all the way through Revelation to Revelation chapter 12. When finally, you know, that dragon, that serpent of old, Satan, is clearly portrayed as eschatologically the dragon. So, I like this. If you lay a hand, this is the other one. If you lay a hand on him, you'll remember the struggle. You'll never do it again. <laughs> yep. It okay. only takes once. That's right. It's like putting a fork in the light socket. You probably won't do it twice. All right. Well, let's uh, close with a word of prayer, and we can say it in fellowship and as long as we want. Father, how we thank you for the wonderful gift of your word. Lord, we thank you for the example of Job. Uh, none of us are so arrogant or bold as to think we could do better. But because of the struggle with you, with, with, through which you put him, because of this loving dialogue that you exposed our absolute lack of understanding, our lack of power, our lack of knowledge, Lord, and yet you have said that you are our shepherd, you are our keeper, you are our protector. Father, we can rest in that. Though the entire world might seem uh, confusing and difficult, frightening to us, we can know that you truly are good and that you have deigned all things to work together for the good of those who love you. How we praise you and we thank you for these affirmations of faith, for the humility which the world, word of God brings us to. Might we embrace this message with understanding and abide in the peace that comes from recognizing that we are very small and very much loved by the creator of this universe, so much so that you became one of us in the person of your son, Jesus Christ. You gave your life for us, Lord, that you might redeem us. Please, Father, give us hearts of wisdom and spirits of gratitude, and might we love you as we were loved by you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs>